We're joined by the committee chairperson, Independent TD, Michael McNamara. Very good morning to you. Thanks good morning. For, thanks for Thank coming you. in to talk to us. Uh, what questions have you got from Meat Industry Ireland? Well, we've already had Meat Industry Ireland in uh, in the month of July, so I suppose what we want to know is what's changed. I mean, when I um, I asked the representative of Meat Industry Ireland four times uh, what proportion of their members paid ho- sick pay, uh, and I didn't get an answer at that time. I mean, sick pay is important because without sick pay in the private sector, at least, um, people are afraid to be, you know, if, if people have some symptoms, they're afraid mm-hmm. to take a day off. Uh, but this goes beyond, the issue of sick pay goes beyond uh, meat plants. It also is an issue for nursing homes and right across the workforce um, and I think it is something that will need to be addressed um, the Health and Safety Authority are also coming in, this is also their second time coming in, they came in on the first day that, they, that the committee sat um, at that time they had just started carrying out inspections, albeit announced inspections. We now know from Garda briefings that 147 um, files have been sent to the DPP with regard to breaches of licensing laws, notwithstanding the fact that there has been no cluster in the hospitality sector. Mm-hmm. Uh, the acting CMO was at pains to point out that there were 12 cases across the entire hospitality sector, yet on the same day he said that there were 12 cases in the hospitality sector, there were 47 cases and four clusters in the meat industry, and that was just one of very many clusters, and of course since then there's been the huge cluster that's resulted in three counties being shut down So I think we need to know what is happening with regard to implementation of regulations and implementation of um, health and safety at work standards, Mm. specifically in the meat industry. When Meat Industry Ireland were in with you before, they detailed the measures they said they were taking to to protect Mm. uh, their workers and protect the wider community. And they make the point, they've made the point in recent days, that they had a period of 10 or more weeks at the very height of the pandemic, when when the numbers were much bigger than they are now, um, of, of, they say, no no outbreaks, no, no clusters. Do you think you'd get an answer to the question of why it's happened now? Well, I mean, I don't expect to get an answer just from Meat Industry mm. Ireland alone, because Meat Industry Ireland um, don't control, I suppose, what workers do once they leave their premises, or at least sometimes maybe they have been involved in the organisation of accommodation, or at least that was confirmed the last time. Um, SIP2 have come forward with information to suggest that there's considerable, perhaps, large numbers of people living together who work in the meat industry. Interestingly, the Migrant Rights Centre had done quite a, a, albeit a small study, Mm -hmm. uh, the the last time they were in with Meat Industry Ireland uh, and found relatively low numbers living together, but SIP2 seem to have uh, more information on that. We'll also be hearing from workers' Mm -hmm. representatives like the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, SIP2 and the Independent Workers' Union. And the fact that the Health and Safety Authority carry out announced inspections, Mm -hmm. is, is that good enough? Well, I mean, clearly the Gardaí don't carry out announced inspections within hospitality industries. I don't see why. But we have a long history in this state of treating the meat industry differently to other industries and treating them with a, uh, giving them a, a large degree of, of latitude. Uh, we, we also see on today's papers that a SIP tour bringing forward information uh, with regard to bogus self-employment in the meat industry. And we learn from the Migrant Rights Centre that there's an issue with regard to work permits and how they operate, uh, effectively creating almost a, a, a situation of serfdom for, for, for people people who, who uh, unfortunate people who, who work in the meat industry and come to Ireland as third country nationals without the right to work here. And of course, they can't move on if they're unhappy with the conditions in which they find themselves. What about the, 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 the return to uh, lockdown or partial lockdown, whatever you want to describe it as, the, re- the reimposition mm. of restrictions, travel restrictions, other restrictions in, in Kildare, Offaly uh, and Leash. Now, we, we heard Dr. Owen Glynn there making the point that accepting it's, it's a blunt instrument. I mean, he acknowledges it, it that. Is a, but yeah. is it necessary? Do you, do you and, and and, and because he makes the point that it's proving to be effective. Well, I mean, I, I know that even funerals have been limited uh, in in those counties to 25, notwithstanding the fact that there is nothing in the Constitution to suggest that you can limit freedom of religion or um, public worship t- uh, on the basis of public health. You can limit it on other reasons, but not public health. But be that as it may, I mean, we have ongoing restrictions in Ireland, and I'm slightly worried to hear that we don't have what is the end point well nothing no amount of COVID is acceptable and we as a nation have are treating this very differently to other European countries it may be that we're correct and they're wrong and they'll be following us within days but the last time I heard that was just after the bank guarantee and that's not how it panned out I mean there is a, COVID is among us it's inevitably going to remain among us for a protracted period of time we know that Russia has developed a vaccine we hear from Dr Fauci in America that they're not comfortable that that vaccine is safe I haven't heard Dr Ronan Lynn pronouncing either way or opining either way but it is going to be among us for a protracted period of time and the question is how do we live with Covid now the reality is of course that our restrictions are possibly more draconian 
it, given our numbers mm. than other countries. But also we have a health system which has less capacity to deal with any burden. I mean, it's routinely overrun. But, we, you know, we have four ministers for health in mm. this cabinet now. What I haven't heard to date is well, how we're we, going we, to develop capacity in our health system. Uh, but, I mean, if you take one example, the pubs, and, and we'll be hearing from vintners later, mm. they're, they're very concerned that... Uh, well, the, their livelihoods the, have been removed from and them, yeah. the, the planned reopening uh, at, at the end of this month, um, uh, th- their concern may not go ahead because of the way the numbers are going. Mm. How, how should that particular decision be approached? Well, I mean, I suppose it has to be based based on, on evidence, but I mean, I don't know what the evidence... I do know that Dr. Ronald Lynn was very keen to stress that there were 12 cases across the entire hospitality industry mm. on the morning after it was announced that we wouldn't move to phase four, which doesn't just affect pubs, it affects churches, it affects church gatherings, and it even affects GA matches. Um, so it, it almost affects everything that signifies community across rural Ireland. And I mean, there is an issue regarding mental health, there is an issue regarding isolation, and that is, is issue will only be accentuated moving forward. I mean, there's been a lot of focus on young people and their congregation in various unsuitable settings. I mean, we know where they're not supposed to congregate, but what I don't know is where young people are supposed to congregate. They can't go to pubs, they can't go to nightclubs, they can't even go to a GA match. So what are they supposed to do? What are you supposed to do if you're 17, 18, 19 or 20 in today's Ireland?